Uh, hello and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, also known as CCAST. My name is Carly Jewell. I am a conservation biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the at-risk species coordinator for CCAST. Uh, for anyone unfamiliar, CCAST is a platform for peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange and co-production of decision support tools on key management strategies, such as introduced aquatic species. CCAST offers um, support for different communities of practice, including the non-native aquatic species community of practice that we launched in May of 2020. If you would like more information on CCAST or our other communities of practice, please feel free to email myself, Christy Miner, who's on this call, or Matt Graybaugh, We'll go ahead and drop those emails here in the chat. Thank you, Christy. And with that, I'll hand it over to Christy to talk a little bit more about today's webinar and introduce our guest speaker. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Carly. And hi, everyone. Um, my name is Christy Miner. I am the coordinator for the Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice here at CCAST. And webinars are just one way that we facilitate peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. So today we're very excited to host a presentation from Matthew Gray, who will talk about the amphibian pet trade. Matt is a professor of disease ecology and the associate director of the Center for Wildlife Health at the University of Tennessee. He's been studying impacts of pathogens on amphibians for over 20 years, and he served as serves as a chair of the Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Disease Task Team and chair of the North American BSAL Task Force. He also founded Global Ranavirus Consortium and recently hosted the first Global Amphibian and Reptile Disease Conference in Knoxville, Tennessee. Just one final reminder before I turn it over to our presenter. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to just throw those into the chat box and we can reload relay those to the speaker after the presentation. And with that, Matt, I think we are ready for you. All right, thanks, Christy. And um, uh, it's great to be meeting with every everyone here. Uh, I see some familiar names um, in the list of participants. And uh, even for those folks, hopefully this will be some new information that um, you'll hear today. So, um, First of all, I, I really want to acknowledge that um, what I'm talking about today, uh, some of the results uh, that I'll be sharing, but also this new um, initiative that we're working on is really a group effort. And um, there are various individuals that are listed on this slide, but um, you know, and I want to acknowledge all of them, but also the funding organizations that have helped start this. Um, this work. And so just wanted to acknowledge the University of Tennessee Center for Wildlife Health and the One Health Initiative, um, as well as the National Science Foundation. And um, really what I'm gonna share with you today, some is gonna be uh, some background information about amphibians and trade. Uh, some is gonna be uh, some of our results, which is us looking at uh, characteristics of businesses and consumers in the US pet amphibian trade. And then I'm going to end on uh, a new uh, initiative that we're working with the U.S. pet uh, amphibian industry on looking at developing a um, certified healthy tray program. Okay, so with that, um, let me give you a little bit of background about amphibian trade and wildlife trade in general. So wildlife trade in general has really been expanding over the last 20 years. Uh, it's a $300 billion a uh, year industry. Um, we're talking about 2 billion specimens per year being traded, um, a third of those being live animals, 100 different species um, across, you know, uh, lots of different nations. Um, so nearly 200 nations participating in this trade network. Um, the interesting thing is that it's actually not very many countries that really are driving the demand. The United States is the lead uh, country uh, in the world when it comes to imported wildlife. Uh, the EU is right with us um, as well as far as their, their, their um, contributions towards imports and demands of, of consumers there. 
So really, those two entities are are really demanding, you know, over 80% of the trade in the world. And um, these animals are uh, coming from all over the place. Um, Christy, can you see my my cursor that I'm moving, the arrow? Yes, I can. Okay, great, excellent. Excellent. So this is a, a, a nice figure that uh, uh, Christine Smith put together in publication Equal Health a few years ago that uh, really shows this is the uh, origin of imports, uh, wildlife imports uh, into the United States. And this is where they're, they end up with respect to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service regions um, as far as them being imported. Um, and so first of all, if you just, this is across all wildlife species, we're gonna talk a lot about amphibians today, but this is across all wildlife species. Um, and uh, so you can see the majority of, of imports are coming from Asia, followed by the Americas uh, and then, then Africa. And as far as the leading regions that are receiving animals, it's the uh, Northeast, the Southeast and the Pacific Southwest as far as Fish and Wildlife Service regions are concerned. Um, if we take a little bit closer look and, you know, start, you know, thinking about, you know, what regulates trade, et cetera. Um, so many of y'all are, are aware of, of trade and wildlife and, and the greatest concern is basically their population levels globally. And, and that's driven by CITES and uh, member nations of CITES. Um, but there's no programs in, in the U.S. to um, think about things at the microbe level. So, we're, you know, we're not only transporting, um, you know, the animals themselves, but obviously the bacteria and the viruses and fungi that are a part of, of, their, of, of their natural microbiome or, or may even be uh, pathogens themselves. Um, in the United States, the trade of domesticated or agricultural animals or agriculture animals are uh, regulated uh, by USDA, APHIS. And um, those uh, pathogens that are listed as OIE notifiable, so listed by the World Organization for Animal Health, um, have to come with an animal health certificate indicating that there's evidence that that shipment is free of those pathogens. But um, there's no programs that regulate that for wildlife. And so basically, uh, the, the, the gates are pretty wide open when it comes to wildlife being imported into the United States and other countries for that matter, and then bringing microbes that could be devastating to um, the, the, the actual industries of wildlife trade, um, the opportunity for spillover to the wild, uh, and having negative impacts on biodiversity and even spill over to, to humans and the human population and negative impacts on health if those pathogens are zoonotic. So um, we, um, there's still a, um, that, that exists today, there's still sort of a regulatory um, loophole there and, and um, there aren't any programs to help facilitate uh, that, that clean trade or, or what we call healthy trade. Um, and I think uh, meaning or implying that what we want is to trade healthy animals that obviously might have nice microbiomes with respect to, you know, keeping them healthy, but aren't carrying things that would have negative consequence to our biodiversity or human health. And so I'm going to shift a little bit here and start talking about uh, amphibian imports. So it's a uh, been estimated, although this is probably likely underestimated, to be a $3 billion industry in the United States. Um, the, the U.S. comprises over 50% of that global market. Uh, half of the animals that are imported, uh, of the amphibians that are imported, are bullfrogs, and those are generally, most of those are destined for the, the food trade industry. And then the other half, so about two, it ends up being about 2 million animals per year are destined for the, uh, the pet industry. Um, what you see here with this figure is that most of the animals uh, that are imported nowadays are frogs uh, with a occasion of some salamanders. So this is caudate is these small little lines down here, the salamanders, and this is a neura, all these big, big bars. So most of the amphibians that are imported are frogs. And um, 
this uh, green bar here indicates where the majority of frogs are coming from, or the majority of amphibians are coming from, and where their basically the destination countries are. And um, so what I did is I basically you can see the the countries here. They're all the various symbols here, but I just wrote those so those can be seen a little bit better. So a lot of uh, frogs that are imported from Nicaragua, Madagascar, Panama. Um, and then the destinations are over here, which is the U.S. comprising over half the trade. But then you can see, as I mentioned, the, the more uh, de developed uh, countries of, of, of Europe, but also Japan and Canada and, um, all, as well. So um, the thing that I'm really going to talk about today, and I know this particular group is very concerned about the release of uh, the release of um, exotic animals into the wild and the things that can, you know, from a population standpoint can really negatively impact, um, you know, communities of wildlife here, particularly with, with, with respect to predation and competition and, and those sorts of things. But what I'm going to focus on is the things that we don't see with the naked eye. And those are the microbes that they could be carrying. And, and when animals don't co-evolve together, um, you know, uh, co-evolve with pathogens, uh, you know, these pathogens can, you know, infect hosts uh, across the globe, but uh, they haven't developed generally a lot of times the immune response is necessary. And so they represent these novel pathogens that may come, you know, from very long distances apart and, and, and trade can, can facilitate that if there are any programs to help facilitate healthier clean trade. So I'm going to focus a little bit and talk about these three paths. These are notifiable, by the way, by the World Organization for Animal Health, but um, currently uh, uh, animals that are imported uh, do not have to have animal health certificates for these three pathogens. Um, BD, b cell, which are two type of Batrachychytrium fungus, and then RV standing for rhinoviruses. And collectively, those pathogens have... Uh, been responsible for the decline of over 500 species, at least 500 species globally. And there's quite a bit of evidence about pathogens and trade. And so Christine Smith um, published this a, a decade and a half ago, um, you know, summarizing, you know, that uh, of animals that are imported, um, live amphibians that are imported into the United States, you know, they're you know, anywhere between eight and 62% of them being infected with rhinovirus or BD. And uh, this work done uh, just about a decade ago by Jonathan Colby uh, uh, really supported that as well. This was in um, the Hong Kong uh, uh, trade um, network and which a lot of those animals end up being destined for Europe or the United States. And uh, with uh, prevalence estimates ranging between you know, 15 and or, or 12 and 57 percent being infected with BD or rhinovirus, and sometimes both of those pathogens. So pathogens are moving with these animals. We do have that knowledge. We've known it for a long time, um, and in general, we really haven't done much uh, about it. Uh, pathogens also move through illegal trade, and so there's several studies that are out there that have documented. Um, animals being infected with BD, one of the chytrid fungi um, in, in, um, in, 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 in various species. So if we think about the, let's kind of focus on the US here, um, but this really is you know, fairly similar for really any country uh, that's importing wildlife. So this could just be a general wildlife trade network for a particular nation. And so we have uh, animals that are entering our network here. And, you know, when we think about sectors of the trade network uh, with amphibians, but, but this is also very similar with many other wildlife trade networks. We have businesses that specialize in importing and distributing. We generally have uh, breeders that are specializing in that activity. We have retailers. And then a lot of times you have hobbyists that are, uh, buying animals and maybe have small breeding operations, and this is very true with 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 amphibians, uh, and uh, may you know interact a lot at at trade shows, uh, et cetera, with folks. And so um, we, you know, we have the animals entering in through legal and illegal pathways, 
Uh, they're carrying, they're potentially carrying their pathogens with them. And what we really don't know is what sorts of characteristics within businesses um, or even the behaviors of consumers could affect the, the presence uh, or prevalence of pathogens in the network and, and what sorts of conditions might result in amplification of the pathogen or, or even diminishing of the pathogen. And, and so, um, you know, industry can make lots of different choices here. These are just a few that are listed that are related with bio, related to biosecurity or how they dispose of animals or their waste. Uh, similarly, the practices of businesses can also be dri driven by consumer demand. So do consumers value a healthy status of an animal? Are they willing to pay for a, an animal that is, uh, comes with an animal health certificate and indicates that it's negative for certain pathogens? Um, and so what, what are the behaviors of the consumers? And then certainly government can also influence this trade network through various policies, programs, or regulations. And, and again, from the wildlife standpoint, we're going to really focus the three pathogens that I mentioned are, are, are wildlife pathogens. They're pathogenic to amphibians. They're not zoonotic. Um, so we're, you know, really concerned about, you know, things from industry or consumers, um, the pathogens themselves or the animals being released and entering into natural ecosystems. And that's been shown as uh, occurring in, in, um, in different parts of the world. And so uh, one pathogen I'll talk a little bit about, uh, Batrachychytrium salamander vorans or B-sal, uh, it's believed um, was introduced into Europe through, through uh, the pet trade. And so we know folks uh, release amphibians. This is just an example that was on caudate.org of somebody finding a Chinese fire belly newt um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. They posted it and they, they asked, you know, is this species going to be, you know, is it, is it going to be a concern? Should we be concerned with this animal out there? And, you know, somebody responded and, and basically, you know, said, you know, um, they're not condoning, you know, having synops released in the wild because in reality, it's unlikely that it's ever going to have a population established and uh, negatively impact, um, you know, uh, animals. Well, um, we all know that that is not true. Florida is a great example of lots of animals being released and establishing wild populations. But really, I think the bigger issue here is the, um, you know, is that they're not recognizing, these particular individuals aren't recognizing that there are microbes, things that we don't see that could be on there, that you know what, that animal, there could be one animal, and you're right, you need more than one animal to reproduce of a species, but it could just come in contact with another animal or shed a pathogen, and that quickly you have pathogen introduction. And so this is really, you know, a concern, and, um, you know, the most likely way that we have these, you know, wicked pathogens that might move across the globe enter our populations is, is through trade and then, you know, behavior that results in either the aquarium contents or the animals themselves being released. And so let me give you a little bit of background about these three pathogens. Uh, Batrachychytrin denervatidis, or BD, uh, was discovered in the late 90s. Um, it has a global distribution. There's lots of different strains of it. Uh, there, some strains are more pathogenic than other strains, um, but there's evidence that it's resulted in um, over 90 species extinctions uh, and, and has been deemed the most lethal, um, um, I guess, wildlife pathogen of, of current history that we're aware of to really have effects on groups of vertebrate species. So, um, ben, you know, I'm sure a lot of y'all have heard about BD. It's a pretty wicked skin pathogen. It thickens the skin, so it's a, it's a fungus, and, it, and its uh, zoospores result in the skin becoming really thick. Um, and as a consequence of that, it affects osmoregulation in amphibians, which is a necessary function for various physiological processes. Ultimately, it results in electrolyte imbalances, and the animals, um, it affects their muscle contraction ability through affecting the what's called the actin myosin cross bridge cycle and it the animals become paralyzed and ultimately uh, this animal here is actually dead uh, this is in panama this is a glass frog 
it's frozen there dead. Um, and so if a predator doesn't nail you because you're really lethargic, then um, ultimately what will happen if it progresses to the final stages is that there's the animal dies from cardiac arrest because the heart is a muscle too and can't contract. So the a new species of Batraca kitrium was discovered in 2013 in Europe, um, and it was emerging in fire salamanders, European fire salamanders, which are fairly common species in Europe. And uh, it exists in Asia. This was found out later, uh, and, and doesn't seem to be happening, having any negative impacts on populations there. So it is believed that through um, uh, the the trade of of salamanders from Asia to Europe and it's which really the Asian salamanders used to dominate trade um, be, when it came when it came to salamanders when it comes to salamanders because they're really colorful etc people like the way they look um, that that was the most likely um, route of introduction and it's caused really serious population declines I'll show you a little bit of evidence of that. And uh, what it does, unlike BD, is BD thickens the skin, affects osmoregulation. regulation. B sal actually uh, creates these necrotic ulcerations and literally perforations through the hole. Uh, it's like you know putting a bunch of punctures through the amphibian skin. And uh, so we have some uh, students that are working on that right now, and it appears that uh, the way it kills the animal is disrupting osmoregulation, regulation, similar but in a different way. Than BD, but um, it can also for species that don't have lungs. So the most speciose family of salamanders are the lungless salamanders, and um, if they be if they become infected, that could affect uh, their ability to respire. But it also creates these holes that allow for opportunistic bacterium to to get into the bloodstream and and create other issues as well. And so there's really evidence of potentially all three of these things. Uh, different um, um, mechanisms causing uh, path or contributing to pathogenesis. The other uh, pathogen is a virus, ronavirus. Uh, frog virus three or FV three is the type species of this genus. It was discovered back in the '60s. Uh, there are six different species of ronavirus, of which one is is FV three. Has global distribution. Has caused severe declines in wild and captive pop populations. And you can see the statistics there. The, the interesting thing about this pathogen is that it can cause disease in amphibians, reptiles, and fish. Um, it's a hemorrhagic disease, much like Ebola is. It um, can infect multiple organ, organs, uh, and it, it basically takes over the cell function and the cells die, um, including blood vessels. And so the hemorrhaging that you can see, like you can see in this tadpole here, the hemorrhaging is a consequence of the, 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 the capillaries becoming very weak and then because of the cells in them dying and then blood starts to leak out of them and create basically internal bleeding. And so um, uh, ronaviruses, uh, again, we've seen die-offs uh, here in uh, around uh, the Smokies up in, um, if anybody has been to the Smokies, Cades Cove area, this is Gorley Pond. These are actual, uh, these are larval um, uh, marbled salamanders uh, that, that have died from ronavirus, uh, but also box turtles as well. And so I'm gonna show you a couple of videos uh, here. One, this top one here is actually a uh, striped newt, which is a species of conservation concern in, in, in the Southeast that is infected with B cell. So we've done some experiments here at University of Tennessee in a biosecure facility, look at the susceptibility of various species. And this is uh, a striped newt that is uh, at the later stages of B cell to trigger mycosis. There's convulsions, lethargy, yeah, loss of writing ability. Um, and so this animal is basically paralyzed. And it, this, the, the symptoms really, the, the disease signs develop very quickly. Um, this animal was fine just literally like a day before. Infected, but appeared to be fine. So this animal here is humanely euthanized at this point. 
And down here in the bottom, this is a box turtle that uh, this is somebody else's video, but it's dying from ronoviral disease um, out in the wild. And ronovirus with box turtles tends to really affect their respiratory system and, and tear it up. And so this animal is, is literally suffocating. Um, it's in respiratory distress. And um, so, uh, and for turtles, they tend to die a lot slower than amphibians. I, um, they're really relatively hardy <laughs> animals. So they end up being in this condition uh, in the wild for actually several weeks. <clears throat> One thing I just want to point out is with all of these, with all of these uh, pathogens, uh, transmission can occur very easily. One, one contact between an infected and a susceptible individual can result in successful transmission. Uh, environmental persistence is anywhere between 3 and 14 days. And what that results is a, a capability of these pathogens to invade a population very easily. The r naughts uh, have been estimated between 3 and 10 for all three of these pathogens. So r naught, which I think most of y'all are familiar with from our, our COVID experiences, is you know, well, on average across a population, an infected individual, how many susceptible individuals does that individual give the pathogen to? So an R not a three means I would give a pathogen, a particular pathogen to three individuals on average. Okay, so we, a lot of y'all have heard about the, the impacts of BD. There's lots of evidence out there. What I'm going to share with you is just showing you what can happen when it, for B sal. So this is a population that of uh, uh, fire salamanders in Belgium. And literally, uh, so these are estimates before, uh, basically as B cell is being introduced um, into the population and the population crashing due to B cell contributing mycosis within a matter of a few months. And so population declines uh, from these pathogens can be uh, very quick. Um, um, at least locally. Okay, uh, here's an example of ronovirus. And so this is a novel uh, species of ronovirus that was introduced again from Asia into, um, into Europe. It's a common midwife toad virus. And uh, this is in the Picos de Europa mountain range in Northern Spain. And um, uh, again, this was documented these populations where communities of amphibians were followed over several years. And we see multiple species experiencing annual die-offs and declines, alpine newt, common midwife toad, and common toad due to this ronovirus. So we have, uh, th those are just a couple examples, but there's a lot of evidence that, um, that when pathogens are introduced from where they are not native, um, they can really have severe severe population and community level impacts for uh, the three pathogens that I'm talking about today, BD, B cell, and ronovirus. But, you know, there's also threats to, to commerce as well. So again, the amphibian trade industry doesn't want to have pathogens either. Um, it negatively impacts um, their livelihood. This is just an example of a case that we were involved in um, as far as diagnosing. Um, and in this, this was ronovirus in that, in, that got into this captive population for of this breeder. And uh, I mean, literally lost, um, you know, revenues of over $100,000 within less than a week. So um, the pet amphibian industry is very interested in, in trying to come up with ways, solutions to, to reduce the occurrence of these pathogens um, in animals that are traded. Uh, we, we actually uh, uh, estimated that uh, based on some surveys that we did, and I'm going to share some of the survey results here in just a second, but that uh, the, the U.S. pet amphibian trade industry could, could be losing up to or close to $200 million a year due to um, uh, the presence of, of BD and ronovirus. So I'm going to shift gears here and talk a little bit about this uh, pilot study that we did using funds that were provided by the UT uh, One Health Initiative. And for those that are interested, you can go to this um, tiny URL uh, to read about. There's an executive summary there, and we'll have some papers that will be published shortly about it. But we really wanted to know 
you know, get some ideas about characteristics of U.S. pet amphibian businesses as well as consumers. And so, um, uh, I'll, yeah, I guess I'll also mention that uh, we fortunately just secured um, a grant from NSF as well to expand this research. So this is the uh, website here, healthyamphibiantrade.org, that uh, we'll be having, you know, um, information on our, our new initiatives and the new project. So <clears throat> the seed project or the, the seed grant, the pilot project that we did, which was um, uh, a year or so ago, we partnered with the Pet Advocacy Network and uh, two prominent uh, businesses, uh, Reptiles by Mac and Josh's Frogs, to basically kind of get, get our surveys out. And uh, we didn't want to penetrate all of the amphibian trade industry. We just wanted to get some initial pilot data. And uh, basically, this was an anonymous survey that we sent out. And uh, ultimately, we, we, it was sent out through email list. And uh, we had some online presence. And we also distributed flyers and things like that at some, some uh, amphibian trade shows. And we ended up having around 100 businesses reply and, and around 400 consumers. And I, I want to acknowledge Dr. Neil Pudiel and his uh, postdoc, um, Kevin that really kind of led these socio these initial socioeconomic surveys and, and really summarized the data that I'm going to present here in just a bit. And, then, and again, like I mentioned, we really focused on the characteristics of businesses and consumers, their knowledge of amphibian pathogens and the threat of, of spillover <laughs> and various, um, you know, biosecurity practices. Uh, you know, are they doing various biosecurity and husbandry practices and their willingness to play for clean trade, both, both for, um, businesses and consumers. So I'm going to just summarize uh, this data here. And first of all, we asked businesses, um, you know, of their transactions, what percentage are imported and what are domestic transactions? And so um, the majority of businesses are actually trading domestically. Um, and so if we just look at what's coming into the United States, that would give us a skewed idea of of what of animals in in our trade network, but also uh, the pathogens that that may be there. I, I think that international trade is really important when it comes to the introduction of pathogens, especially from um, from uh, you know long places from places far away from us. But uh, it's really the domestic trade network that has that potential to either diminish the the pathogen. Uh, the presence of the pathogen or amplify the pathogen. And so, you know, there's, there's around 2 million amphibians that are imported to the pet industry uh, per year. Uh, we're probably talking over 20 million amphibians actually in the industry at any given time. And uh, so really domestic trade really can play a major role in either maintaining or amplifying or the opposite, dampening pathogens of the system depending on their practices. And so what we asked the businesses was, uh, you know, where do you acquire your um, amphibians from? And then where do you sell them? And so the interesting thing here, um, a lot, well, not surprising, a lot of businesses are acquiring um, amphibians from breeders. Um, but the other thing is, is that they're also acquiring a lot from hobbyist breeders. So hobbyist breeders are small time breeders defined as like less than 20 tanks, you know, they're, they're making, you know, less than $5,000 per year um, in, in their revenue. Um, they're, they're doing this because they enjoy doing it. Um, but they are really, you know, have an, a possibility of really impacting the trade network. And uh, when we ask businesses, who would you sell them to? Again, a good number went to households, but also a lot being sold to hobbyists. And so this is really, um, we really know very little about the hobbyist role in the U.S. pet amphibian trade network. And all previous studies that have done anything with pathogen surveillance um, or questionnaires or anything have really, for the most part, ignored this group. So we did find, uh, this was comforting, that at least the businesses we, we surveyed, um, that most use disinfectants. Um, most use disposable gloves when handling animals. 
And um, most individuals or most businesses quarantine new shipments that come in. Um, few businesses though, even though they quarantine animals, they don't, they generally don't test. I guess they just quarantine. And if they don't die after a while, then they put them into their general population. So, you know, this really, you know, shows the importance of, of maybe outreach and the importance of testing new arrival, new arrivals that, uh, new arriving shipments. Um, 75% of the businesses did not, or reported that they didn't uh, decontaminate wastewater or aquarium contents, which is concerning if that wastewater or aquarium contents ends up ends up outdoors. And um, that can certainly be a pathway for, for spillover. Uh, we published a, a paper a few years ago, this was in China, and um, this was a, this study here was a uh, a ronavirus that killed a bunch of fish in an aquaculture facility and upstream of it uh, was a um, was actually a, a Chinese giant salamander farm that had a ronavirus outbreak and um, the, the the viruses were identical between both of those facilities. So um, again, there, there's been evidence with ronaviruses that they can definitely flow downstream and flow into other facilities uh, and if you have running water but you know this can also be just surface um, disposal uh, that that also could result in an animal coming in contact given the environmental persistence of both chytrids and and ronavirus um, even even in soil so um we asked uh you know wanted to get a feel for a business's knowledge of of biosecurity and so, and, and really the threat of spillover. So we asked them, you know, are they concerned about the transmission of pathogens uh, from the pets to natural areas? And, and most were very concerned. Uh, they realized the importance of it, of these pathogens, the potential impact on natural or wild populations. Um, we also asked them, you know, it, it, is, it, is it difficult um, uh, or it is not difficult for my business to adopt. So, you know, about two thirds said it's not difficult. Uh, but again, we're seeing this drop down a little bit here. Um, and then it takes too much money uh, to, 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 to actually implement biosecurity practices. Again, this is most say, no, it didn't, but you got still about a third, to, you know, of the businesses that are, uh, you know, think it might, they think it might be difficult and it might cost too much. And so, you know, this really, you know, so U.S. businesses understand the threat of these pathogens, but some are hesitant to incorporate biosecurity practices because, again, it might be difficult or, or cost too much time and money. Really, again, emphasizing the importance of this is where outreach could be directed towards businesses, but <clears throat> maybe there could be cost share programs as well that could help businesses with implementing best uh, biosecurity practices with, within their facilities. Um, Okay, uh, we, we actually did do, we actually asked them uh, whether or not they had any sorts of die-offs due to chytridiomycosis or ronavirus, or chytrid or ronavirus, and six to 18% of them said they did. Uh, we actually had two businesses that indicated a positive detection of B-cell. To our knowledge, we do not know B-cell exi exists or uh, within the United States. This was an anonymous survey, so we could not go back to those biz, those individuals and be like, hey, can we sample? Uh, we feel that the, the those were probably erroneous, erroneous data entries um, because there's only a limited number of U.S. laboratories that can actually test for B-cell. Uh, generally, best management practices are that you then confirm with a second laboratory and that you contact the North American B-cell task force. Um, so most laboratories in the United States, diagnostic laboratories, know of, of that. And uh, to date, there's been um, no positive cases that have been at least reported to the North American B-cell task force. Okay, so we also asked uh, businesses if they were interested in acquiring um, amphibians that were certified as pathogen-free. And uh, again, the... Uh, majority of businesses said yes, they they would like some sort of certification program. And um, we asked them if uh, amphibians uh, at their, uh, if, they, if they were free of, if they could certify their amphibians, would they, they could be profitable for them 
or it would help their public image. And again, most of them, you know, think it could help their public image and help them as far as selling, uh, sell, selling their animals. Okay. And in summary, the majority of businesses were willing to pay up to 20% more for pathogen free amphibians. So uh, shifting gears here, we look, we asked consumers, we wanted to get a feeling for pet amphibian consumers. And um, again, I want to preface this with this survey is a little bit biased in the context that it went out to members of the Pet Advocacy Network, Reptiles by Mac, and Josh's Frogs, which may or may not represent amphibian consumers broadly across the United States. But uh, in general, the consumers were fairly, um, had some college, uh, some of them had graduate degrees, et cetera, had bachelor's degrees. So, uh, you know, fairly well-read, maybe uh, potentially tr trained or skilled um, group of consumers here. And, and I was really surprised to see where do they get, you know, a lot of their information. Of course, websites is up there, but, um, you know, also some, some individuals here are, are, are um, actually reading scientific journals. And where did they acquire uh, most of their amphibians? Most were from pet stores, um, again, online retailers, a few from hobbyist pet shows, et cetera. Uh, this is interesting that some collect them from the wild. So you, there are states that allow for collection of wild amphibians. I, I don't know where those individuals got their animals. Uh, assuming it was um, allowed, I guess my greatest concern is a lot of times if you collect something from the wild and you don't want it anymore, you, you might not you might not think it's that big of a deal of releasing it. And if you bring it in to a captive uh, situation and it is interacting with maybe exotic animals, uh, you know, it could potentially result in a transmission event that later, when you don't think, I'm not going to release maybe this this frog from whatever South America, but uh, I'm going to let this bullfrog go that I had, and now I don't want it anymore. And um, lo and behold, now that thing may be infected with a novel pathogen. So on average, the cost that they were willing, that they, they paid, that they reported paying was around $50 per amphibian. So they're, you know, spending a good amount of money. Um, and, and I mean, some individuals are paying, you know, over a hundred bucks per amphibian. Um, so, okay. The, in general, um, when it came to consumers, they were knowledgeable about pathogen threats to amphibians, but they were less aware than businesses about what they could do. So again, this really kind of emphasizes where maybe some outreach education could, could occur with consumers. We asked them if, uh, what did they do if they had a dead amphibian? If the amphibian died in your collection, what did you do? Um, and 80% uh, of them uh, had indicated that they did have a, a dead amphibian uh, at some point, you know, in, in having their collection, and that most of them uh, buried the animal outside, which we do with a lot of our pets. Um, there is some risk of spillover or contamination by just burying an animal, uh, but it's, it's not as big of a deal probably as just leaving the animal outdoors, which some individuals did. Um, which, you know, certainly could result in some sort of transmission or persistence of a pathogen. Uh, some went into the garbage, a few flushed them down the toilet. Um, for unwanted amphibians, um, <clears throat> individuals that reported that they gave their, most in, individuals gave their, their amphibians away if they had to, if they, they didn't want it anymore is what they reported. Uh, some participated in pet amnesty programs. Again, those are kind of far few in between in the United States. Florida has a great one. Um, and then a few individuals reported euthanizing the animal. So um, importantly, over half of the response indicated that in the future, uh, they would it'd be extremely important that that amphibians they bought were free of pathogens. And another 27% uh, indicated very important. So, you know, we're talking around, you know, 80% of the respondents of consumers said, yeah, we don't, I, I wanna buy an animal that is free of pathogens. And, and we, it, it was specifically geared towards Ronavirus BD and, and B cell. Um, three, uh, three quarters of the response indicated um, that they would be willing to pay more for that animal to be certified as free of pathogens. And so we did some estimations um, 
And uh, we estimated that uh, given them different price ranges, et cetera, that uh, the average consumer would be willing to pay up to $38 more per amphibian in order to verify that it you know, was free of, of those three pathogens. So the, you know, given the average cost of an amphibian was around $50 that folks are paying, um, you know, that represents, if you add another $38 on top of that, you know, a 77% increase in cost. So, you know, folks are really willing to pay quite a bit more. From the business standpoint, it only costs about $25 to test an individual amphibian. And really best management practice for testing is you can do batch testing, you know, like within a tank, et cetera. Um, so, you know, even if you just look at the individual animal perspective of testing, um, it really represents a, a $13 per amphibian um, profit margin. So that's a 26% increase in profits that uh, businesses could acquire by basically testing their amphibians and being able to certify if there was a certified, if there was a, a, a pathogen-free certification program available. So let me just summarize quickly and, and just, uh, and, you know, let, you know, just to kind of bring all these ideas together. So <clears throat> businesses and consumers are aware of the pathogen threats uh, uh, to amphibians. Um, and, but, you know, especially the consumers need to be informed a little bit more about biosecurity practices and, 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 and businesses as well, especially with respect to testing. Um, businesses and, willing, uh, and consumers are willing to participate um, and place value on acquiring pathogen-free amphibians. Businesses indicate they're willing to pay up to 20% more, consumers up to 77% 77 more for an amphibian that's pathogen-free, and that the profit margin is around 26%, probably higher to sell amphibians as being pathogen-free if they're certified as pathogen-free. So our results really do indicate that an industry-led market-supported healthy trade certification program uh, is feasible here in the United States for amphibians. And that, you know, we should really think about developing and really put effort into outreach education on biosecurity practices for both consumers and businesses. So with that being said, um, again, this is the, uh, the new um, website that we've just put up associated with the NSF project. Um, um, Christy mentioned that uh, we recently hosted the first Global Amphibian and Reptile Disease Conference here in Knoxville, Tennessee in August. Um, in June, July, and in August during the GARD Conference, we started to organize a working group, or we did organize a working group to begin getting ideas together about what a U.S. Um, certification program would look like that would be industry-led um, and, and voluntary. And so a variety of businesses were involved in that process, as well as some uh, friends from USDA, APHIS, uh, to talk about certification program requirements that they use, and, and a variety of, of, of universities are involved too. And so we are in discussions currently, we're still meeting every couple of weeks. And um, our goal is, you know, to hopefully launch a program in fall of 2023, uh, where um, the certification program would involve certifying businesses. This is a kind of a practice that uh, the canine care certification program for businesses is about breeding, um, breeding canines and making sure that a canine that comes from a business that is um, canine care certified has gone through certain practices and met certain rigor. So you know that you're acquiring a, a healthy and, and a good animal that's been treated properly. Um, so it really is a, a nice model for potentially this certification program. Purdue University organizes that certification program. So uh, the ideas that have been put forth so far is that businesses would need to complete online training and testing. There would be required biosecurity practices, some required animal testing. Uh, if there were positive cases of BD, um, B cell or ronavirus, or there were die-offs, it would need to be reported. And that the businesses would um, agree to a certain code of ethics that they would follow these practices. And obviously there would be an annual membership fee as well as, as, as refresher training. So um, anyways, that's where we are right now. And I'd be certainly happy to talk more with folks about this um, 
if there's interest and I'll leave it with this last slide with some contact information. Thank you, Matt. That was a, a great presentation. I personally learned a lot. Um, so that was really great. Uh, we didn't have any questions come through in the chat, um, but if people want to, uh, it looks like we just had one actually. So we'll start, we'll start there. Um, and in the remainder of the time, people can also, I think, unmute and ask questions. Um, first question is, were such a program to be implemented, how should we manage our expectations given the sheer magnitude of potential disease vectors? Would this be more of a stop or more of a slowdown or delay in the spread of novel pathogens? Follow-up question, do you see native populations being able to develop resistances to these path pathogens over time? I know that was a lot of questions. I can yeah, no, back no, up. No, great, great <laughs> questions. Um, yeah, so I would anticipate that this would um, at least initially be maybe slowing down until this becomes part, if this, if the practice of certification is recognized by the trade industry and it becomes common practice, then it can be a real barrier to pathogen entry because, um, you know, if there are testing requirements for animals that uh, are arriving at facilities, then we should catch it there between facilities or coming into the country. Um, so it really has an opportunity to really stop the problem, um, you know, potentially quickly, but you would have to have buy-in by a, a good percentage of the industry. Um, that percentage uh, is something that, um, you know, our models, modelers will be working on trying to figure out and, and what components of the industry might be or sectors might be the most important to focus on. Um, as far as resistance, uh, some species are naturally really resistant to um, these pathogens um, and, and it, or, or, I, or I could say even tolerant of infections. Uh, and then some species are, are completely resistant. So, but, but the, 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 the dynamics of amphibian immune response to these three pathogens um, is extremely varied. Uh, and there's always gonna be susceptible hosts within a captive setting and, and certainly within wild populations. And, and to be honest with you, we don't, we've learned too many times from exotic pathogen introductions, we don't wanna chase outbreaks. Uh, whether it's outbreaks of wildlife pathogens in, 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 in bats or amphibians or, or fish, because it's extremely difficult to control and eradicate in the wild. So this is our best chance to really think about stopping, but, but you can also treat um, you know, pathogens and animals within captivity, at least for the chytrid fungi, um, pretty easily. For rhinoviruses, there's been a vaccine developed, but it isn't commercially available yet. Awesome. Um, another question came in here. Is there an existing code of ethics or will this be developed by fall of 2023? Yeah, an existing code of ethics. Yeah, we haven't worked out the details of that. But ultimately, I think it could be fairly simplistic, indicating, yes, of these practices that are required of me as a business, uh, I agree to do these. And um, so it, I think it could be fairly simple and we could certainly pull from other certification programs, their, 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 their language to do that. Awesome, sounds good. Um, do you anticipate having um, an annual guard conference? Yeah, as far as the guard conference. So, um, there will be future guard conferences. We had a post-conference survey and it was, you know, overwhelmingly in support of future guard conferences. And, uh, so the steering committee, um, uh, there was also about equal support for the conference to be standalone just by itself, like it was this year and for it to be a joint conference. So what the steering committee decided to do was to, um, try maybe alternating be between those two types of formats. 
And so the next guard conference is going to be a, pair, a joint a conference with the World Congress of Herpetology, which is the largest herpetology conference in the world. Um, it's actually going to be in Malaysia, um, which will be a really neat place to, to visit. And, uh, and then it'll likely come back to the United States for the next Congress. So it'll be every two years, not every year. So every two years, um, with the next one being in Malaysia, we have travel grants that we'll be offering, et cetera, to try to get folks uh, that, um, that might need funds there. Very exciting. Um, all right, a couple more questions coming in. The current model being contemplated is a voluntary compliance, but what potential do you see in, in incorporating the testing or labeling framework into regulatory systems? Um, that That's a, a great question. Uh, I, I think it, it, it is possible, um, but uh, let me also voice this uh, as, you might anticipate um, the trade industry would rather do this voluntarily um, instead of being told or forced. If there's, if we can get compliance and participation by most of industry, and again, I'm not sure what that percentage is, um, we can figure that out through some modeling uh, exercises. Uh, it could serve as effective as any regulatory um, issue with potentially a lot less resources. So if we're if there's going to be a regulatory program, obviously there'll be a lot of resources um, from the government, for example, that would need to be put into that, uh, that might even re result in re requiring inspections and all that kind of stuff. So it would take a, a lot of buy-in, I, I would say from Capitol Hill all the way down or, or from state governments and a lot of resources in comparison to the feasibility of potentially industry-led program that is really the market itself supports it and uh, the businesses support it and may be as effective or more effective. So I, I only think time will tell depending on how popular and how much the industry picks this up. Awesome, that makes sense. Um, the last question was about accessing the survey results and it looks like um, it looks like that's in the chat. So thank you, Carrie, for putting that link in there um, so people can see that. Uh, we have time for maybe one more question if anyone has one before we close out. All right. Um, yeah, lots of kudos here in the chat. So hopefully you're seeing that. Um, thank you everyone for taking the time to join us. Uh, this webinar was recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel, which we'll throw in the chat. Um, you can also find all our previous webinars there. Also encourage you to visit our CCAS page and our case study dashboard where we currently have 168 case studies. For those who are interested, our next webinar is on November 8th. This one will be from Scott Durst from the San Juan River Basin Recovery Implementation Program, and he will be speaking about non-native fish management in the San Juan River. So please contact us if you'd like to receive those webinar announcements and aren't already on our mailing list. Uh, thank you all again for your time, and especially to you, Matt, for giving this um, excellent presentation, and we hope to see you all again soon.